Good evening, fellow WBU Mountaineers. I'm JT Thomas, a former football player from the 90s. And I want to welcome you to a second in a series of diversity webinars put on by the WBU Alumni Association. Tonight, we have three panelists and former athletes that I'm excited to present. They'll be talking about their time at WBU as African American athletes, where life took them, and how they have become leaders in their community. Let me introduce these three great guys. First, we have Jim Lewis, the first black basketball player on scholarship at WVU from Alexandria, Virginia. JT, good evening. How are you? How are you doing, Jim? Good to have you. We have JT Thomas III, a linebacker and retired NFL player from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and he's my son. Pops, good to see you as always. <laughs> And Lowe's Moore, one of the most exciting basketball players ever to wear the blue and gold and a Mount Vernon, New York resident. Good evening, gentlemen. It's a pleasure. How you doing, Lowe's? Good to have you. I'm good to be here. I'm glad to be here. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us tonight. We're excited to hear the things you're about to share with us. And let's get ready to go. First, we'll have Jim Lewis. Jim, if you would, could you tell us what it was like attending WVU in the late 60s? Well, first of all, again, I'm really excited to uh, have this opportunity to share my experiences uh, from my days in Morgantown. I'm from Alexandria, Virginia, a uh, suburb of Washington, D.C. And back then, um, if you made the old Met team in the Washington Post, it was a really high honor. So I was very grateful to be able to make that because it involved players from Maryland, D.C. and Virginia. And George King was the head coach at West Virginia University at that time. I graduated high school in 64 and signed. And uh, we had a tremendous uh, freshman class, uh, four players from the state of West Virginia, Dave Reeser, uh, Ron Williams, Dave was from St. Albans, Ron's from Weirton, Ed Harvard's from Weirton, um, Lewis Hale was from Kermit. Our center was from Elkhart, Indiana. His name is Dick Penrod. And then my roommate, uh, I was a little ne neophyte, 17 year old, and my roommate was uh, uh, a veteran of the Marine Corps, Norman Holmes from Washington, D.C. So um, we had a wonderful experience, lived in Borman Hall. Uh, this was pre Twin Towers. Uh, we did move to the towers when they opened the first two towers in 1965. But our freshman team was one of the top five freshman teams in the country. And uh, even though I was the first African American to sign, I, I like to think of you know, again, the collective unit, the team, we happen to have four African-Americans and four Caucasian uh, players. And we're still in touch today, which I think is a testament to uh, the kind of environment and leadership that, that went on there. Uh, I was a journalism major, really enjoyed that aspect, working for the Daily Anthenaeum as a sports writer. And, um, you know, the, uh, the challenges for us really were not on campus, nor at the university in general. Uh, we had some challenges by being uh, the northernmost member of the Southern Conference. So when we played um, some road games, particularly uh, at Davidson and Charlotte and, and the University of Richmond and Richmond, Virginia, you know, there, there were some real ugly moments in terms of uh, uh, racial animus. But uh, we won the game uh, and um, we were able to grow and learn from that. So so those those four years from 1964 to 68, uh, very injury ridden, unfortunately, on my part. In fact, uh, tell uh, Bob Huggins, I still have a year of eligibility because I was <laughs> redshirted, uh, but I was ready to graduate and my knees just wouldn't hold up. So uh, it was a great time. Jim sounds like it. Now, you know, Jim, I had a great pleasure meeting you a couple of years ago, man, and it's really been interesting. Uh, and I look forward to our discussion tonight. I'll be seeing you soon. Nope. All right, let's hear from JT Thomas III. It's going to be very interesting to hear this story. I know a little bit about this story. How you doing, JT? I'm doing well, Pop. Right. I'm going to call you son. All right. So if you, <laughs> if you can tell us a little bit about your experience uh, as an African-American athlete at West Virginia University. Well, first and foremost, man, I'm just truly honored to be here today with these legends, man, you know, to be able to share my insight and perspective. Uh, and I truly think I had a unique one, and it really all started with you bringing me up there as a young kid. 
uh, you know, about seven, eight years old, all the way down to my first uh, training camp with the Mountaineers when they knew they would come back and uh, recruit me in, in high school. And uh, I think for, for me, it was a truly life changing experience uh, simply because, well, for one, just uh, 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 the perspective, the mountains, seeing the world at a whole new angle. Right, coming from this flat uh, environment down here in Florida, where I am still today, uh, to be able to see mountains and snow and things of that nature for the first time, truly eye-opening and life-changing. And then, uh, um, you know, to be able to grace the campus as an African American uh, athlete, uh, definitely was able to be exposed to some of the uh, finer things that uh, Morgantown has to offer. You know, uh, in, a, in, in the sense of always having that special uh, community feel uh, to, to somewhat feel some of that local celebrity, uh, some of the pros and cons of it as well, too, uh, in the sense of uh, it can be a very good thing. And at times uh, uh, feeling a little bit too much of that stardom too soon can be bad for the players at times. But uh, it, it was all it all worked together for, for the good. And uh, but for me, that's what I remember most, almost feeling that life changing type feeling in a sense of having to speak a little bit differently to people that didn't look like me. And just quite frankly, it was culture shock. And uh, and I and I didn't understand that the, 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 the time and the shift of demographic. And, you know, a little bit pop. We come from a predominantly a black community down here. So 80, 95 percent of the community is black. So for me to be in Morgantown and uh, on the elevator in the Wendy's and the only black guy at times, it was a bit of a culture shock, but it was good, you know, in a sense of having to be able to understand that, uh, you know, definitely have to judge people from their character and, uh, and how they treat you and necessarily something that you have seen for seen before or not. So uh, definitely a very uh, eye opening and privileged experience being an athlete uh, there with West Virginia. And you just get this feeling of understanding that you're in a special place, you know, and maybe it was because I was an athlete there or maybe it wasn't, but there's this special air about Morgantown to where you only know unless you go kind of thing. And uh, I've always felt like that was the thing that, that we held uh, uh, close to us most as a family. And then uh, later on as, a, as an athlete at WVU. JT, as you know, I've been up for about 26 years and, and things haven't changed. Morgantown's been, uh, great for me and my family, and I'm glad to have you on. I uh, look forward to hearing what you got to say throughout the, the broadcast. And now we'll we'll have Lou, Lowe's more to reflect on what it was like to be a black basketball player in the 1970s. How you doing, Lowe's? JT, I'm fine, man. Uh, just uh, want to thank you guys for the privilege and opportunity to uh, to come on and and talk about an experience that I, I hold dear to my heart, uh, which is West Virginia University. And, um, you know, I like to start with, uh, you know, being recruited by West Virginia and finding out that uh, Jerry West uh, played at West Virginia University. And I was a big fan of Mr. Clutch. And it was one of the deciding factors that uh, led me to West Virginia, as well as the as well as the coach, Coach Jim Amick. Um, you know, he he presented and represented West Virginia so so powerfully uh, to me and my family uh, and made several trips up to have dinner and uh, with my family and I. And it was just an instant uh, relationship um, from the very beginning uh, that stands even today. And and, you know, then uh, meeting Joe Frizz, Joe Frizz, I was in the uh, Dapper Dan along on the same all star team with Joe Frizz from Aliquippa, Pen uh, Pennsylvania, and and realized that Joe was going to West Virginia, too, as well. And and Joe and I ended up being roommates at, at West Virginia when I when we arrived uh, in our first year and uh, we grew to be best friends and uh, actually was in my wedding. Uh, you know, I loved him and I loved his family dearly. Uh, may, may he rest in peace. Um, you know, and then, you know, coming from a very diverse community like Mount Vernon, New York and experiencing other cultures from the Boys and Girls Club to the Mount Vernon School District and then coming to West Virginia um, where there was less diversity at the time. Uh, you know, the only diversity was on, well, you know, football and basketball had the most diversity. And so 
uh, you know, going to a class and being the only uh, black person in that class was a little weird. <laughs> uh, being asked the question all the time, are you a basketball player? Are you a football player? You know, from everybody that seen me um, and like a like an African-American couldn't just go to school at West Virginia University. They had to be an athlete. And I told them, no, I'm just here to go to school until they saw me in the blue and gold game. Once they saw me in a blue and gold game, they said, oh, man, you lied, man. I said, well, you know, I'm more than an athlete. You know, I'm not a dumb jock. I, you know, I'm a pretty intelligent guy. But and then they said, OK, OK, I got it. I got it. But my my four years at, at West Virginia um, as an African-American player, I loved it. I, you know, I loved the excitement. You know, it was said to me, right, that college is what you make it. Right. And and uh, I came there to make something. I came there to graduate and I came there to, uh, you know, prepare myself for opportunity to play professional basketball. And then I realized it's no matter where you go in the in, in, in the nation. Right. Unless you go to a, a historically black college. Right. Colleges are the same all over. And I just needed to make it. I just needed to make something happen. I hear you. Those I want to thank you, man. And we're going to be talking throughout this uh, panel, man. And I'm excited to hear what you got to say. Oh, thank you, JT. All right. Hey, I want to remind those of you who are watching and with us tonight, if you have any questions, please go to our comment section uh, and submit your question. And we'll try our best to answer those questions as we do our broadcast. All right. Uh, guys, as we all move on and leave college behind, what has been your path since graduating from university? Quick career synopsis, post career, and a little bit about your family. I'd like to start off with Jim Lewis. Well, uh, I guess I'm the veteran of the three of us tonight, uh, and I'm proud to be 73 years of age. Uh, but I graduated, I said, in 1968 with a journalism degree. And I, I like Lowe's and, and JT, you know, wanted to be a professional athlete, but it, it wasn't in the cards being a professional coach subsequently was in my future. So um, I have coached for the last 50 years on the high school level, boys and girls. I've coached uh, four uh, men's college teams and I've coached four women's college teams. Uh, I was also involved um, with USA basketball, which is really the highlight of my coaching experience because when you have a chance to represent your country, there's nothing like it. And we were fortunate enough to win three gold medals and one silver medal in international competition. I also coached in the WNBA. I was the first head coach of the Washington Mystics. And then I also coached with the Minnesota Lynx, the Indiana Fever, and lastly, the Los Angeles Sparks with a, a pretty good player named Candace Parker. So uh, I've been blessed. I uh, didn't grow up wanting to be a coach, wanted to be a pro player, as I said. And the role models that I had in my life from a high school coach to the coaches at West Virginia, George King that I mentioned earlier, who recruited us uh, and Bucky Waters who coached us because coach King left. And, and I certainly have to mention Earl Lloyd, who's the first African-American to play in the NBA. He was my, my mentor my entire life. Uh, and he helped me get into coaching uh, at Tennessee state. And it was interesting because it was 1969 uh, JT, you know this name, Ed Tutal Jones. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Of the Dallas Cowboys was a center on my freshman team. And uh, I think he made the right choice. He's a good player, but uh, football was his best sport. But nonetheless, my first foray into coaching, um, we went to the national championship game. So I was like, man, this is pretty cool, this coaching thing, you know. Uh, but uh, I'm from a great family of educators. Uh, three of my sisters are either – teachers, principals, or college professors. And then I married really well. My wife, Karen, and I have been married for 46 years, and we're blessed to have two adult children, uh, Jennifer, who is Dr. Jennifer Lewis, and our son, Christopher, who played basketball at Harvard University, six feet eight, and he's the president and CEO of his company here in Washington, D.C. So we're, uh, we're really blessed to be back home uh, for good, uh, singing in the choir together, my wife and I are just having a great time. <laughs> Jim, that's absolutely awesome. And again, uh, I, I, I'm just so excited to hear more about what we, uh, what you guys have to offer and what you're going to share with us later on. All right. Uh, after, I, I want to get JT back up here. Uh, uh, 
In fact, I want to ask JT uh, when he left college, what was his path, and you know if he you know can give us a little insight on his career synopsis and a little bit about his family. So, so uh, you know, after leaving WVU, was very much like uh, the start of our segment and a little bit of adversity there right out of the start. Right, uh, I, I come out in a lockout year, right into the NFL. So, uh, and what ended up happening, there was something very special, something that I can't take a whole lot of credit for, right? My stepmother, Rochelle, I had this great idea of me taking uh, one of my brothers, Jared, who's autistic to, to his eighth grade prom uh, with a young girl whose name was Jocelyn Lavelle with, ep uh, 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 with, with not epilepsy, but- uh, what was that? Spina bifida. Spina bifida, yep. Yeah, been hitting the head too many times, right? <laughs> uh, but it's one of those things where uh, we were able to be in the right place at the right, right time and to be able to do something special for someone and gave us that sense of feeling good about doing great things for kids right out of the start. So that was a you know a very significant moment even before playing a down in the NFL. You know, I remember leaving WVU uh, a lot, like a lot of other kids and not knowing exactly what was going to happen with the NFL. I uh, came back home to Fort Lauderdale, Florida with one of my buddies, my best man in my wedding, um, uh, Anthony Leonard. Right? We trained our butt off. Uh, I was able to get uh, picked up right there in the sixth round with the Chicago Bears. And Pops, you were there at the house that day. I know you were, it felt like the first round, didn't it? <laughs> you remember they made a mistake, right? They made a mistake and called your name in the third okay. round. Right. Well, you know, the Cowboys of all people, right? Retiring a giant and the Cowboys of all people. Uh, draft me mistakenly in the fourth round, and we get all excited, babies crying, and it's not even me, right? I don't get the call. When I finally, Lovey Smith took a chance on me in the sixth round. We get that call, and, I, and everyone's excited. That was a great moment for it. So there, in the NFL, bounced around a little bit. Uh, into the, there with the Chicago Bears, drafted, drafted there, played some good good ball there with uh, with Jacksonville, the Jaguars. Probably my, my favorite place to have played in the NFL back home in Florida. Gus Bradley was a great coach, really honed us in on the process. Uh, and from there, uh, to be able to play and finish my career with the New York Giants, you know, as a six-round draft pick, to be able to stay in the NFL for twice the league average, you know, pops three and a half years, seven, eight-year career there, man. You know, I can't really complain. You did well. You did well. <laughs> you did well. Right. And, and we continue to do great things off the field for kids. Uh, we, we took a kid to the Super Bowl there. Remember there, there in Annapolis where, you know, where, where my future wife was, was, was from with me not knowing uh, there in Indianapolis. And the game that the Giants come back and beat the Patriots in the Super Bowl. JT, so, uh, and we wrap up. There's one thing I want to mention that you didn't talk about, right? The JT Thomas Foundation. You've done a lot of work uh, with the JT Thomas Foundation, son. I'm so proud of you. Uh, and I and I, I wish you nothing but the best, and I know you'll do well. Uh, and we're gonna keep this thing rolling. So let's keep on sharing and talking about what we got going on. Uh, and we'll we can't leave out my man Lowe's Moore. <laughs> uh, gotta hear a little bit about what Lowe's got involved with after he left college. Uh, a little bit about his career and a little bit about his family. How you doing, Lowe's? JT, I'm awesome, man. Uh, you know, I feel great. And uh, yeah. Um, you know, somewhat after a disappointing, uh, it not not so much school wise, uh, but you know, we we made it to the championship uh, of the Eastern Eight and lost in 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 the championship round. I mean, I ended up after losing in winning MVP, and you know, then you know, sitting around, start training for the draft, and, and end up getting drafted by. Of the New Jersey Nets in the third round and started my professional basketball career. Played a year for New Jersey, then then I went into Cleveland, and then I went into the uh, at that time with the San Diego Clippers, now LA Clippers. Uh, played with them, uh, you know, for a season, and then you know played about five years in the CBA uh, with some great coaches, uh, you know, George Call and Phil Jackson and and uh, Bill Musselman. And, you know, and, and then I end up, I end up getting married uh, to my wife, Patrice Wallace Moore. And, uh, you know, she was a, you know, played basketball at Fairfield University. And uh, we've been married 37 years now. Uh, you know, four kids. Uh, my oldest daughter is a principal in the Bronx. My youngest daughter is coaching at Fairfield where she received a full scholarship, got her master's from uh, West Virginia University. 
Uh, my oldest son, Lowell's the third, uh, is out in California. He's an actor. Um, he's acting out there. And then my youngest son, who was Isaiah, who was born with spina bifida. And uh, but he's graduated high school, finishing up college and coaching able body basketball. Um, you know, for the last 27 years, up until March of this year, I was uh, the executive director of the Boys and Girls Club in Mount Vernon, New York for, for that long. And now I'm the host of the uh, Lowe's More the Blueprint on Facebook. I mean, uh, <laughs> so it's been great. Absolutely, Lowe's. I, I'm so excited, and, and I and we're gonna get into it a little farther uh, when we talk about your impact on the community, your involvement with the Boys Club, man, is just really awesome. And we're gonna we're gonna keep it going. So next up, we're gonna we're gonna get JT back up here uh, because I wanna uh, hear your experience working with you as a community leader. And I want to know what are the pressing and the greatest needs among the youth of our undeserved communities as you see it? Well, you know, and, and just ra wrapping up there, I ended up retiring there just, just officially this last year, but been out of the league for about two years where I got right into what we were already doing and serving our community. I did something very similar to like what you did in coaching the youth team that I ended up playing on when I was a youngster. And I think there's no better way to really get an idea of what our community needs than right there at the ground level, mentoring, coaching kids, and being what some of them uh, uh, don't have in a sense of that leader and father figure in their lives. Uh, you know, to be able to have some kids uh, who may not have a parent pick them up at all and kids, you know, who may have the, 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 the group home van come and interrupt my practices. And to, to me, it seems like some of the more underlying issues outside of, you know, providing safe sports for the kids uh, is to be able to provide a greater level of education at the ground level to kids being raised and leadership, developing more leaders in our community. And that can look like a lot of different things. Uh, for some kids as the father in the home, for other kids as the entrepreneur and the small business owner. And then at times as the coach, you know, to be able to play football. But I think that comes last in the sense of it should be a privilege after making sure you secure things like an education and, uh, you know, behaving in the home uh, to be able to be allowed to do something like participate in youth sports. So the thing that I can identify the thing uh, identify with most, you know, uh, as a former athlete, uh, current business person and philanthropist, uh, you know, is the need for education. Uh, serve directly in the communities at home from a local standpoint. That's why I feel like I can give the most perspective currently uh, in some of the things that we're actively doing for the youth and underserved communities. JT, you've been doing a great job. I've had the, the great opportunity to see, you, see sit back and watch you work with those young people. And I, and I have to say, you know, your future is bright and philanthropy and everything that you do. Um, so again, um, it's going to get a lot more, uh, we're going to have a lot more conversation. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna fall back and I'm gonna bring Lowe's more back up, uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna ask him from his experience working with the youth as a community leader and try to determine what has, what has been the pressing and the greatest needs among the youth of undeserved community as you see it, Lowe's. Yeah, I want to piggyback on uh, something that uh, JT the Third said and and the importance of education, um, but for me, uh, as a part of that that uh, focus of education is, is the literacy. And, and for me, uh, I wrote a book uh, maybe three or four years ago and it called From the Boys and Girls Club to the NBA Life on the Now Road. And my first two chapters, I talk about, number one, I talk about the importance of family, right? Regardless, some, sometimes in our families, there's dysfunction and there's function. Right. And and uh, and that's you know, that's family, though. We love them when they dysfunctional. And we love them when they functional. And the other the second chapter dealt with illiteracy, dealing with obstacles, dealing with, uh, you know, the toughest part of whatever your weakness may be. And for me, it was illiteracy. And, and so I had in order for me to fulfill my dream as a basketball player, you know, I had to understand the importance of reading, reading comprehension, writing skills. And I spent like my um, entire sophomore year in a remedial program. I mean, many people don't know that they will know it now if they read the book. But uh, once I overcame the issues of illiteracy, um, then I went on to excel as an athlete. So for me and the pressing need for me today is illiteracy, which is 
uh, over 70 million people who are illiterate in America, right? And the numbers of out, are outrageous with African-American boys not knowing how to read. It's not just reading, but it's reading comprehension, right? And the ability to write. If you can comprehend what you read and you have writing skills, man, you can go, you can go anywhere in the world. So for me, that's the pressing thing. That's the thing that I focused on uh, at the Boys and Girls Club is making sure that kids were illiterate, were literate, and that they would graduate and go on to have a a a, a very powerful future, whether it's an entrepreneur or get a college education. Lowe's again, I, 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 and I'm glad you were able to touch on your, your literacy program because I, you know, so it, it's so you know, very much needed. Uh, and guys like you, I know, will continue to do the community great service. Uh, so next, uh, I want to bring up Jim Lewis and pose that that same question to Jim. Uh, as a community leader, Jim, Jim, what do you see as the pressing and greatest needs among our used and undeserved communities as you see it? Well, I think we're looking at three perfect examples. Uh, and I'm being very humble in submitting myself along with Lowe's and JT in that we're all back in our respective areas from, from which we came. And that says a lot, it really does. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great world out there uh, and we all have experienced it through athletics, uh, which is a great uh, equalizer, if you will. It, it opens up so many doors. Um, but when I think about how, again, one person made such a difference in my life, next to my father, Earl Lloyd from Parker Ray High School, in Alexandria, the schools were segregated then, uh, helped me to get to Western University. Um, and he helped me to get into coaching. And I remember looking up to him because he was 6'6", number one. <laughs> but I remember looking up to him when he would come back in his off seasons in the NBA and work the playgrounds because NBA players weren't making uh, what Lowe's Moore made. No, they uh, weren't making what uh, you know the guys are making now. and. Um, and it was such a blessing to hear this young man tell me that I inspired him because he saw me when I was a student at Western University and I was back home in Alexandria um, with a suit and tie on. I don't know where I was going, but he saw me and it inspired him to want to do more. And so through my 50 years of coaching, certainly I've had the opportunity to uh, hopefully be impactful uh, positively with young people through camps, uh, through speaking engagements, um, you know, through our uh, uh, faith-based uh, involvements. You know, in fact, we have a, uh, an HBCU festival, which is the largest one in the country now, where 10,000 students come uh, to the Washington Convention Center because uh, we've grown so much and they get scholarships on the spot, they get admissions on the spot. Uh, and Western University does a lot of that as well through their college uh, uh, programs, um, high school, programs at uh, high school nights or college nights as they may be referred to. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be involved with that. Uh, I wanna be more involved than I will be because the Washington DC metropolitan chapter of Western University is the largest uh, to my understanding outside of the state of West Virginia. And so um, it's important that, that uh, Lowe's and JT and myself continue to tell these stories about our experiences because the university has changed so much uh, and it was great when we were there, but it's so much better now. You know, uh, enrollment is, uh, has exploded, facilities, uh, the diversity is, it, it looks like America. Uh, and uh, we want to keep in touch and we want the university to keep in touch with us and utilize our, our knowledge and our willingness to want to participate uh, as much as we possibly can. Jim, I, I want to thank you for those words. And again, I, I know how hard you all work and um, your rededication to WVU and what we're trying to do here. Uh, I'm going to bring the rest of the guys back on and uh, I'm going to pose this question uh, uh, to JT3 first. Uh, JT, uh, how can WVU alumni in our communities rally to help and what are the possibilities? Well, I think it starts with things like what we're doing right now. And I have to tip my hat, hat off to Lisa Franson down at uh, WVU South Florida Mountaineers for putting this event uh, together and, and, and out of sheer 
uh, true wanting to do something to spark something towards what we're doing as, as, as cool as now and uh, having the conversation to start. Right. And then from, from there, creating plans that specifically um, um, target and affect uh, African, uh, African-Americans in particular. I say that because uh, there's some issues that we're going through specifically from a um, at a disproportionate rate, uh, from police brutality uh, to things like education. Uh, racism itself has a very big, ugly cloud of, of a face. And you know, I think we go about it at tackling specific issues on our own front lawns and our everyday walk. Uh, and, and, and in the midst of that, also recognizing and being aware that poverty doesn't have a color. Uh, uh, to be able to learn some of the other things about the state of West Virginia and some of the areas that I can uh, can say I've called home and being affected economically from things that aren't in place, whether that be uh, education or mental health, things that are a little bit deeper than our basic needs, like food, clothing, and shelter. Things that if you aren't affluent, you almost don't know they exist, right? Uh, uh, And you talk about things like literacy uh, and lows. You think... there's a much different um, um, uh, result from a kid who might know 500 words and the kids who knows 2,000 words. You know, one, one kid may not know how to express himself as, as better as the other one. So I think it starts at our own front lines and our own local communities. I think specifically as, as it pertains to WVU, we have to do things to contribute to um, – uh, our demographic base in the sense of, you know, there's only 3% of, of, of African-American students uh, uh, at WVU for the most in the same in the overall state of West Virginia. So being able to put together scholarship that can send a kid of color, you know, to the University of, of West Virginia, or even to uh, be able to experience something along the lines of uh, seeing one of the few um, uh, uh, black uh, CEOs in Fortune 5. There's only five black CEOs in the top Fortune 500, uh, 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 in the top Fortune 500. And, and Mr. Frazier is actually a, a, someone who my dad works with, the CEO at Merck. So it's one of those things where making sure that they're exposed and aware of leadership at a high level, that they understand excellence, are exposed to it, and that the resources make it from uh, corporations you know, all the way to the ground level in, in programs and events that truly impact the kids. So, yeah, I say it starts on our own front line and the, the different alumni chapters can contribute towards something that sends a, 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 a minority and, and particularly an African-American student, you know, to, to West Virginia, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Jim, um, what, what's your thought on, on how your how alumni in your area uh, can help uh, deal with these issues? Well, again, I think it it's a collective effort, obviously. Um, and I, I want to point out the fact that, uh, again, we can't always keep looking back. We're looking forward, and I'm, I'm accentuating the positives of, uh, for example, uh, Ms. Porter, who's the Vice President for uh, Diversity and Inclusion at Western University. Uh, I'm not sure if that's a new uh, position, uh, but she's fairly new in it. Uh, and just having her, a Black female, um, with her credentials and accomplishments, uh, speaks volumes about the direction that the university is looking to go. And uh, there's so much to give. Uh, we're, we're we're three and a half hours from from Washington D.C. to to Morgantown, and that's an easy ride. Uh, so the kids can come up and see, you know, uh, different classes or different types of programs that are going on. Uh, I think uh, the obvious thing that's going on is the exposure that athletics uh, gives to young people. You know, uh, again, having coached all these years, a lot of kids make decisions based on uh, how many times they see Duke on TV, how many times they see West Virginia on TV. Uh, and so there, there's an automatic built-in component that uh, is working for us. Um, I didn't know a thing about West Virginia University uh, until I was recruited, but uh, we, as former athletes, can really play a significant role. I know retired Dean Dana Brooks uh, did a wonderful job in putting together uh, a three-day forum that allowed me to meet guys that uh, had played Pat White and uh, the great quarterback out of Pittsburgh whose name escapes me right now because I'm 73. Uh, <clears throat> 
Yeah, Major Harris. Yeah, you know, just having a chance to to share our um, collective experiences. You know, each one teach one is important. So we are excited to be on this show tonight. It's going all over, and I know the phones are going to be ringing both ways. Uh, in fact, I got a call uh, about an hour before we went on uh, from the Mountaineer um, Athletic Club asking for money. So I'm gonna write this big check. You know, sometime after I check with my wife. Uh, to, keep, to keep it rolling because uh, there, there are great things going on in Morgantown. Thank you, Jim Lowe, who posed that same question to you. How can alumni uh, help uh, uh, with this issue as well? Yeah, um, you know, based on the comments of uh, JT the third and 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 coach, um, you know, West Virginia University, uh, you know, is like a family. I mean, when you know, young people and people across the country, when they see WVU, right? I mean, I don't think they impose, well, uh, you know, it's racism or they don't like people or, you know, there's a difference. They just see WVU and they, oh, you went to WVU? And that's what people say. Oh, you, you know, over the last two or three years, man, I'm, I mean, as the executive director, I used to go to these different fundraisers and people would find out that I was from, from WVU, man. It was just like a family thing. Oh, you went to WVU? What year were you there? And and so the brand is so powerful, right, uh, to, to push people from one place to another place. And so when alumni are present, whether you be African-American, whether you be white, wh whatever your uh, nationality is, if if you uh, think about how important or the impact that you could have, number one, as a mentor, right? And if you're in, in the area like New York, and I know there are a lot of business people, a lot of individuals who graduated from West Virginia who are business people in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, right? And, and if there was an opportunity for kids at the Boys and Girls Club or kids in high school to be able to go shadow uh, at your business, or for you to come as an alumni, come to a local uh, community organization like Boys and Girls Clubs or YMCA and, and share your story about, you know, how you became successful. I mean, that would be very powerful. Also, you know, you know, to join campaigns like mine on, on dealing with the issues of illiteracy, you combating illiteracy in America, you know, combating the problem of literacy among African-Americans you know, uh, would very, be a, a very powerful thing. You know, think about, alumni should think about, and I, I know, and uh, you heard some things tonight, Sean, the president of the Alumni Association, start talking about some things that are happening right now. As we know those things, we're going to share those things, right? And, but I, I do think if you have capacity that we should, as alumni, we should be uh, giving up our time, our talent and our treasure. Right. And then we will be a blessing. Um, we will be a blessing to West Virginia and we'll be a blessing to the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to remind those of you who are with us tonight uh, to certainly pose your questions uh, in the chat. Uh, and as well, I also want to share with you that this is being recorded tonight and it will be sh uh, shared on social media. Uh, so, guys, what I want to do right now, I want to go right to the first question. And that first question is for JT3. And the question is, when you're discussing West Virginia University and your communities, what are some of the pers perspective, uh, the comments and questions you get from others? Well, you know, first and foremost, I, I, I you know, I, I never um, slow about letting them know that it was the best experience of my life. Uh, in the sense of the uniqueness of the uh, experience uh, and to be able to communicate that, you know, um, just like Lowe said or Jimmy said, you know, if a kid doesn't know, some people may not necessarily know uh, where West Virginia is, you know, let alone, you know, what they might think about places where there may not be many people who look like them. And I often just remind them that uh, Morgantown, uh, you know, is the place where I, I experience uh, minimal racism, especially from people to come in person. If anything, you know, uh, you know a sense of interest and uh, 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 curiosity. Uh, whereas wanting to understand a little bit more about my culture and me wanting to do the same. So, um, yeah, I just try my best to communicate the fact that there's nothing that I can tell them that could uh, truly um, 
um, explain the experience of being in Morgantown in the mountains. It's a different uh, type of air you're breathing. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, it's a different type of focus when you know you're maybe a thousand miles away from home. And, uh, you know, some of the ups and downs, or, you know, a little homesickness there. But, you know, the great times definitely outweighed the times where you kind of felt like you might have been a little bit further away to, uh, from home than you expected. So, yeah, I always just remind people just about what a wonderful experience it was. And it truly was for the most part. Great deal. So second question is for Mr. Lewis. What is your favorite memory of a WVU journalism school now, we College of Media? How did it prepare you for your launching of your career? That's a great question. I thank my wife for writing that uh, question <laughs> for the chat line. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, there were several sequences from which we had to choose as journalism majors, uh, radio and television, uh, editorial writing, uh, advertising, public relations. I chose the public relations aspect, but to the question, uh, I was fortunate enough to write a um, uh, editorial in the Daily Antonym, and it was titled, entitled, uh, Come on, Greeks, quit picking on chickens. Uh, now, we, you know, we, we, we all know we did our little uh, crazy immature college antics. So uh, I won't say which um, Greek organization it was, but I, I wrote a, uh, a column and the university received $500 and I received $500 with it, which had to go into my scholarship. Uh, but nonetheless, it was the William Randolph Hearst Scholarship Award, award for editorial writing. And I, I was so uh, so happy that I was able to share that. Uh, and, 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 and lastly, I really enjoyed writing features on my teammates because who knew them better than I? Um, uh, and so, you know, the great Ron Fritz Williams, who was the All-American on our team, um, just uh, had a unique perspective on life. I mean, he never had a bad day. Um, and so it was nice to share that because uh, the, the general public doesn't always get to, to see us. You know, they applaud us and we, we're appreciative, but the, there's an intimacy about uh, Team members, with, and I never, you know, I never told the dirt. There was no dirt anyway. You know, we were all perfect <laughs> little boys, little guys. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, great. writing, writing was a, a real therapeutic uh, aspect of my education. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, this question is for anyone. <clears throat> if you could pass on one piece of advice to a current student athlete at West Virginia University, what would you share to anyone? Um, well, I, I would share, as I, I, I tell most kids in high school, I, I always ask the question, do you plan on going to college? And, and mostly 90% of the kids will raise their hand and say they are going. And I say, okay, you're going to go if they're freshmen, you know, four years from now, sophomore, three, you know, two years, three years from now, if you're a junior, two years from now, I'm senior, one year from now, you're going to be going to college. They say, yeah, yeah, I'm, you know, when I graduate. I said, well, it's important for you to live forward, right? And and so you should be a college student now. You should be asking the question uh, that many of us should have asked when we, were, when we were on our way or thinking about going to college. What does the freshman do in college, right? And And start doing what those freshmen would do, more reading, <laughs> more reading of books, books that you are interested in and books that you're not interested. Become a college student while you're in high school, right? Live in your future. Don't live in the present. Gotcha. Anyone else? Well, my, my take might be a little, little bit contrary. To that. <laughs> not too much in the sense of, you know, I, I believe in staying ready. You know, that's my life philosophy and something that I didn't get into some of the bouncing around in the NFL and not knowing if the next day would be in the same city or not. And uh, and I'm realizing that, you know, that 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 adversity, that leadership factor is something that's uh, uh, relative in sports and business to where you, you, you'll be knocked down, you'll be rerouted. You know, I think of my dad and his situation and I always just hold him in high regard because, you know, he was able to come through the JUCO route you know, to be able to grind it out two years in one place, up, go to another. He was already operating like a pro, you know, before people had the, the, the ability to go from one college to the next. So be prepared for things on the field like injuries that could really change the trajectory of what you had in mind. 
for, for college and, and, and to be able to be flexible and adaptive to new coaches. You know, I remember uh, uh, Rich Rod leaving us in the middle of the height of our football era. And, and it's uh, one of those things where it was a blessing uh, to be coached by, by Bill Stewart. God bless the bit. God bless the dead. And we did some amazing things. But uh, uh, just to be prepared for a little bit of everything during your college process, you know, so stay ready. That's what I would tell them. I would say to uh, remain curious, um, to remain humble, and to remain um, empathetic, because uh, in my opinion, uh, those are three great characteristics of leadership. Uh, and here you, here you are at a university uh, where everyone knows your name, and uh, it would be ridiculous for you not to use the networking possibilities that are within your, your grasp, uh, not just when you graduate, but in the summers uh, before your sophomore year, junior year, senior year. Um, Mountaineers want to help Mountaineers. And again, I, I can reflect back on how uh, I was blown away about the number of West Virginia University graduates who live all throughout Northern Virginia, Arlington, Manassas, you know, wherever, because uh, this is where the jobs are. Uh, there are a lot of great jobs in the state of West Virginia as well, but, uh, you know, you have the federal government that's almost recession proof. Um, and so we need, we need to help you and you need to let us help you. And so network with those uh, who have walked the hills in Morgantown, because um, there's nothing like that experience. And uh, if you can make it there, you can make it in New York City, right, Moses? <laughs> hey, definitely. Without that. <laughs> All right, and guys, this is the only one I would I'm going to chime in on because, uh, you know, what I've come to realize over, and I'll be short, is uh, get involved in your local alumni association. I had the great pleasure of serving on the national board of directors as an alumni uh, board member. And I've come to realize there are a lot of resources that the Alumni Association and its chapters have. So I would pass that on to many of the, uh, the young folks, student athletes. Uh, I have another question. How important is it is for everyone to find a way to volunteer in their communities? To anyone? Well, I'll be brief. I'm sorry, Lois. Okay, I'll be brief. You know, no coaches talk a lot, but you know, I haven't had a team in a while. So, uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, volunteering is critically important. Number one, because it shows that you have the tenacity and and the uh, wherewithal to give up your time, not necessarily for remuneration, remuneration uh, for getting paid. And so, uh, but it's a great way to get in the door and to learn systems and relationships that can really open up future opportunities for you. So, so give up your time, volunteer, you know? Yeah, for me, uh, I learned that early at the, uh, at the boys club, now boys and girls club. Um, we were taught to volunteer and, you know, as a cub scout, as a boy scout, as a club member, we were taught about the importance of, you know, helping the, com helping the community clean, keep the streets clean. Um, you know, going to senior citizen homes. Uh, we were taught that, uh, you know, uh, in our families, you know, uh, my aunt and my mom used to always say, you know, go over there and help, you know, somebody who's elderly, who's a senior that they knew. Could you go help them take their clothes downstairs or help them get their groceries, you know, upstairs? I mean, so volunteering at the Boys and Girls Club, I said, look, if you put a, a caring adult in the life of a child, you'll change the child. So, if you just take one hour, even if it's one hour, uh, you know, one hour a week, one hour a day, just to stop off to some organization consistently, right? And just say hello to a kid. Cause many kids go home without having somebody show them love and appreciation, say hello, ask them how they're doing. So volunteering is important. JT, what do you think in terms of how uh, volunteering impacts our communities? Well, I think it's very important. Now, Pop, you know, on my days on campus at WVU, we were a part of and still a part of Omega Psi Phi fraternity. And uh, one thing that was mandated in our program was to give our our time to, to local nonprofits and serving the community. So getting ingrained and giving uh, you know, the kids, for the kids at the college uh, campus, I think is important. 
and then for the professional athletes, you know, especially men of color who may come from underserved communities to be able to give back in effective ways, uh, you know, and, and, and finding your way. So, you know, like Lowe's always says, right, your time, your talent, your treasure, in the sense of for some guys, you know, is putting together programs that are a little bit more hands on for others or finding people to partner with and maybe support more than leading. But, you know, finding your role and your niche and way to give. For, for me, it's always been retirement. Uh, I've always considered that's, that, that the most effective way to teach one on one, face to face, and being able to communicate to the kids. But there are tons of ways to have an impact. So uh, be open minded to how you can impact. And, uh, uh, and yes, everyone should get involved. Quick question of Lowe's. Uh, Lowe's with you, uh, years and years at the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, Omega Sci Fi, is that, a, is that a boys club? <laughs> Man. Man. Yeah, right. I'm a Kappa, and we didn't have Kappa Zorro Omegas in 1964, so we had to go to, to Pittsburgh. So okay, okay, a long way, y'all. Got you, got you. I, I want to pose this question. I want to give you guys a minute and a half to kind of answer this, and it'll, I'll do it to Lowe's and JT, right? Uh, one of the uh, uh, individuals who posted wrote, I like the idea of WB alumni chapters helping with literacy. And their local communities. Do you have a program uh, we can implement or idea that you can share with us uh, so we can help do this? Um, without a doubt, yeah. You know, uh, particularly in Mount Vernon, uh, the Boys and Girls Club of Mount Vernon, uh, we probably need it in the worst way in regards to the awareness of illiteracy and then programs that help kids improve their reading skills. Uh, yeah, so we have that at the uh, Boys and Girls Club here in Mount Vernon. Um, I'm pushing it from, from my platform and also the uh, King Movement Westchester uh, with Chris Broussard is the National Christian Men's Organization. Um, we are pushing uh, the importance of literacy at this time. And, you know, hey, look, I, I fell in love with reading. My wife will not let me go near a Barnes and Noble <laughs> right. If we're in a mall or something, see a bookstore, she will lead me away. And that's what happens when I fell in love with reading. And, and that's how powerful it is. And I would never have been able to graduate from West Virginia University if I didn't learn how to read. Gotcha. JT, uh, you got any ideas, anything you can share the chapters can do in your well, community? Well, for one, in the spring, just make sure they don't miss us down in South Florida every year for our WVU South Florida golf retreat. You know, it's one of those things where they can always come down to see us at PGA National. Uh, you all are always invited. And uh, and, and then for, for, for me at the JT Thomas Foundation, uh, we have the Lamb Lighters program that we've just partnered to, to put together, Shark Tank. Uh, to be able to uh, put together an incubator and business competition uh, that you all can, can su could support. Uh, and, and you can reach us, uh, you know, at my personal email. But to be able to build and you know, partner with an organization like we have in the past with Citrus down here in Fort Lauderdale. So, uh, yeah, you, I, I, I'd encourage you all to come to the WVU, WVU Alumni Golf, Golf Gala and uh, to, be, to stay in tune with the JT Thomas Foundation as we move forward. Yeah, let me say this too. Just tell them you you have my information. You have my email, my cell phone number. Anybody interested in helping with the literacy, just give me a call or email me. Gotcha. And I, I know our Mountaineers will. Guys, I got one more final question for you. Uh, what are some of your favorite traditions that you engaged in at WBU with your fellow athletes or your peers? It, it should be a consensus on, on that, right? I mean, everybody know what the very best thing is in Morgantown. I mean, singing singing the song after every win. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely. <laughs> after every win is stoic. It's, oh, man, it's, it's life is tranquil, you know, country roads. You country know? roads, yeah. And, and, uh -huh. rolling, and rolling that carpet during the basketball game and the shooting of the muscle. Oh, man. <laughs> oh man! Well, I tell you, you know, coming from DC, when I heard that gun go off the first time, <laughs> I uh, I jumped, as, I jumped as high as I've ever jumped. <laughs> yeah. when, when, when I was visiting, when I was visiting, one of the reasons uh, I went also was that uh, West Virginia was the number one had no crime, the lowest crime rate in the, in in the nation when I was 
going there. I said, oh man, no crime. I got to go to West Virginia. And all of a sudden I'm there visiting and boom, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I'm like what's going on? <laughs> Oh, man. I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> Guys uh, and everyone, uh, we're going to wrap up. And I just wanted to thank you all for joining us tonight in this program and, and discussion. Before we sign off, we'd like to thank our special guests and the South Florida Mountaineers for planning this event and for reminding us all of the Mountaineer spirit during challenging times. We hope You'll be volunteering with your local chapters, connecting with the WBU Alumni Association, and staying in touch with West Virginia University. For more information about how to get involved, be sure to visit alumniwvu.edu today. Let's go Mountaineers.